Guten Morgen, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. A warm welcome to our workshop and panel discussion on the topic that is on everyone's lips, that is on everyone's lips in the scientific community, in the publishing industry, in the libraries, the transformation of the publication system in science and research. My name is Raphael Ball, and I'm the director of the ETH Library here in Zurich, and I'm delighted that you, as a listener and as audium, have found your way to the ETH Library, just as I would like to warm, uh, like warmly welcome the panelists and the moderator of the panel, Sven Fund. Before I introduce the moderator and hand over to him, I would like to say a few words on the subject, on the subject of the transformation of the publication system, ladies and gentlemen. We have had a wonderful dinner tonight with the panelists, so uh, we discussed a lot of questions, we discussed a lot of answers, and I guess we found more, quest more questions yesterday evening than answers, so I hope uh, we are full of uh, power and ideas to discuss with you together this important topic. The question is, why do we, as the ETH Library, hold such a workshop? Perhaps it's uh, quite naive, this question, but it is, at the same time, very simple, because the topic is not only on everyone's lips, as I said before, but we at the ETH are, to some extent, pioneers of the open access movement. We were one of the first universities to have an official open access policy, and we are one of the first universities to, to operate a successful and big open access repository. And we are now at the forefront when it comes to analyzing and transformation of the publication system and testing alternative publishing models. Ladies and gentlemen, but we are not at the forefront when it comes to blindly following the mainstream. And we do not turn off our scientific analytical brains when it comes to nothing less than transforming the entire complete publishing system. It is too valuable for us to let it be destroyed prematurely, and it is too valuable for us to let it be at the same time appropriated by individual big and large players and stakeholders of the system. That is why we are asking questions about open access transformation today, and that is why we have invited so many different stakeholders here on our panel at the ETH. The idea was born at a conference with colleagues from Public Library of Science and uh, Royal Chemical Society a few years ago in London, I guess, or in Berlin, um, in Berlin. And uh, we asked ourselves at that uh, conference um, what contribution stakeholders make to financing the transformation from a license-based model to an author-based model. And in particular, we asked ourselves about the contribution of the research active pharma industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the chemical industry, the mechanical engineering, but also at the same time, um, the contribution of private law companies, of private doctors, clinics, consultants, etc. They will all benefit from the open access contents at the but they, since they hardly publish, they will not contribute in the same extent than, um, the, uh, than publicly funded universities. This is, ladies and gentlemen, for example, a question nobody in the open access movement asks themselves, and that is why we are asking it here today. We, as the scientific community and libraries and publishers belong to the scientific community, I am convinced we already take such a step and radically rebuild a centuries-old and successful publishing system, then we have to address all questions, even uncomfortable ones. We want to discuss some of these questions with you today. Ladies and gentlemen, Sven Fund, the moderator of the session, will moderate this morning's session and he will present the participants and the program of today. Sven Fund is a former CEO of De Kreuter. He was part of the CEO of uh, Springer uh, many years ago. Now uh, he is uh, the CEO of Knowledge Unleashed and full stop. He is a founder of this open access company and he is a consultant in the publishing world. We know each other since many years and we fought together 
often uh, on the right arguments and on the right decisions on the publication systems. So it is a, a pleasure for me to uh, hand over to Sven for uh, the introduction uh, in the program and to, uh, to the participants. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raphael. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you can imagine that that is quite a task to manage such a panel with uh, seven panelists this morning. I'm doing my very best. Whenever you feel I could do better, please let me know. Um, I'm quickly introducing uh, the panel um, just with respect uh, to this, to their roles on these panels, I to this panel, on, on, I would say, and not so much with all their academic merits. You can imagine uh, that that would be quite a long list. Um, from right, from your um, perspective to left, um, I want to introduce uh, Santosh Mysore, who after completing his PhD in neurosciences at De Leuven University in Belgium, works now um, at GSK. It's one of those companies where the names become so long that they are abbreviating them. So GlaxoSmithKline is one of the leading research-led companies in the world in pharma. And um, Santosh is responsible for publication strategic planning, deliver delivery of pediatric vaccines and emerging markets publications. Next to him sits uh, Robert Finger together with um, Raphael, probably one of those people who had the shortest way this morning from home uh, to this panel. Robert is a professor of agricultural economics and policy here at ETH. Um, he is with his group, a member of two different departments, which is, I think, uh, not such an uncommon structure here as it is in other universities. Um, so he is um, in the Department of Management Technology and Economics and the Department of Environmental Systems Science. Robert holds a diploma in economics and received a PhD from ETH in 2009 before being appointed as associate professor in 2016. He was assistant professor in Wageningen in the Netherlands and a professor of production economics at the Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms University, Universität in Bonn, Germany. Um, the focus of his research, which I find really interesting, I have to admit, without understanding too much of it, but anyways, um, is um, risk, risk management, and insurance solutions in agriculture, um, climate change and climate risks assessment, and the adoption and diffusion of new technologies, also something that might be helpful here today in our conversations as a theoretical background. <clears throat> Next one is Rafael Ball. You already know him, I guess. He introduced himself already since 2007, uh, 15, sorry. Director of ETH Library. He holds doctorates in biology and history of science. Studied um, at the universities of Mainz, Warsaw, and Moscow. Um, never made it to Zurich, actually, in those capacities, but now he is here. Um, he worked as a scientific librarian at uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich in Germany um, before he became a library director, library university library director at uh, Regensburg University. Um, his main focus is library of the future. Who would have imagined that? Um, uh, science communication and the role of the printed book in the digital age, uh, which also might come up today. Valerie and I, our next panelist, agreed that I don't mention all the companies she worked for in the US. You know that there's a very different culture of um, changing companies quite frequently. Valerie is the senior director and head of global production at Shire, which is since the beginning of the year a Takeda company, also one of the leading research groups in pharmaceutical research in the world. She is based in um, Boston and the head of the Global Publications Group um, across that covers different uh, territories, basically, and different uh, geographies. Um, she held, as I said, different positions in different companies that all had to do with uh, publications. Most of them had to do with publications, uh, which is a really interesting perspective, I think, for us to see how different companies in comparable fields deal with open access and have dealt with it over the last years. Tobias Philipp, our next panelist, studied sociology um, in Bamberg, Germany. Uh, since 2011, he was engaged as a scientific assistant at the University of Lucerne. 
Um, he received his PhD um, in um, sociology as well. Since 2017, he is scientific officer at, at the Swiss National Science Fund, SNSF. I always have to get used to the abbreviation in English here, S uh, Swiss National Science Fund, uh, and is coordinating Switzerland's, if I may say so, open access strategy. Now I need to breathe a little bit. <laughs> you see the panel is quite large. Um, next one is Sibylle Geisenheiner, sales manager of the Royal Society of Chemistry and one of the two presenters of the intro, which we will get in a minute here. Sibylle oversees Europe, Middle East, Africa, and India in her role as a sales director. She worked for very exciting companies uh, before. Um, the most uh, exciting one was obviously De Greuter, um, but also Silver Platter, Thomson Reuters, and Walters Kluver. Um, she is involved in a lot of open access discussions, with, which means that we sometimes meet on panels uh, as today. And it's great to have Sibylle here with her um, input as well. Last, but by no means least, um, Niam O'Connor, who is the Director of Global Journals Development at the Public Library of Science, which you all know as PLOS, um, I assume. She is based in the UK um, still, um, and uh, oversees the strategic development of publishing assets as of one of the largest open access publishers in the world. So that was not everything I had to say today. Um, now I'm handing over to the two presenters. I don't know who's going first of you. Okay, Niam is going first and will give us a little bit of an overview of um, what PLOS does in open access publishing, what the challenges are today, and then we can head from there into Zibilis presentation and then into the discussion. If you don't have any questions so far, which I assume and hope, um, let's get started with Niam. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael and Sven. It's, and thank you all for being here today to discuss the future of open access and the roles of different stakeholders with us. <clears throat> I'm just going to pose some questions for us to consider as part of the panel discussion. And as we are here in Open Access Week, as I imagine some of you know, the topic for this year's Open Access Week is open for whom? And that's really one of the things that we want to talk about today and how different people are able to participate in sharing their research. So <clears throat> in thinking about this, I was really thinking, rather than assume that everybody sees the value of open access and open science, this is the description that was used by Mark Schiltz in talking and positioning Plan S when that came, um, and really looking at how open access offers the opportunity for science to work in a different way and in the way it should, where research information is available to everyone to be able to read and discover. And I think that's a really compelling offering but I think open access on its own is only one part of what's really open science, thinking about how we make data available, how people are able to build on research that's already done, and really change how we do research to be able to make discoveries more quickly and allow everyone to participate in the process. Of course, one of the big questions that then comes, and a central part of our discussion today, is how do we pay for this because it's not free? And in thinking about this, I went back to look at the very first paper published in PLOS Biology, the first of the PLOS journals to launch in 2003. And as you can see here, the founders of PLOS positioned this as simply changing the way we support scientific publishing. And in many ways, I think they were right to think of that as simple. But my question for you is, 16 years later, is it simple or not? And I think we have seen in that time that some parts are simple, but actually there is a real question about how open access and open science work 
for a diverse and global community. And I think there are parts in this where if you think about how it works for an individual institution, then we see a real change in who is paying a lot of money for the research. And while if you look on a global scale, perhaps things look like they are the same, but for an institution, for example, like ETH, there is a big difference in the cost of paying for subscriptions and the cost of paying for open access for all of the papers that are published. And so in many ways, it means that the people who were paying previously are not the same people who are paying now. And I think this is something we really need to think about and I hope maybe discuss today. And so really this leads to my point of how do we get to equity and inclusion in sharing research? It, there is no doubt but that making open access possible through a system where authors or funders pay through um, article publication charges enables the research to be available to be read and to be built upon by other scientists. But it also creates barriers for people who don't have money to participate, for early career researchers, in many cases, who may not have the same level of funding as their colleagues who are further in their career, for people in developing countries who previously may have had trouble reading the articles but could choose to publish, whereas now they can read the articles but perhaps are not so easily able to publish. Um, and it also makes a big difference thinking about people doing research in industry and today thinking particularly about pharmaceutical companies, since traditionally people working in companies didn't publish as much as people who were working in academic institutions, partly because of the way that career progression works and the expectations for sharing research. And in this, I think we really need to think about how we can be inclusive and make sure that that contribution from industry to both the cost and participation in research sharing continues in an open access environment. And so my challenge for us today, because, you know, I like to take a view, I am I am a chemist and by nature very optimistic about kind of what will happen. I think that's a fundamental nature of kind of how scientific research works. Um, I think together we need to find a path to be able to have greater availability of information, greater inclusion in the research process, an increased speed of discovery and innovation, where we can really drive towards the fundamental aim of science and research of actually making a better society for all of us. And I believe by working together, we can do that. So I hope that has positioned some questions for us today to think about how we can be more inclusive, how we can make the economics of publishing work for advantage of all of us. And now I will hand over to Sibylla for some more detailed thoughts on the topic. Hello, um, my name is Sibylle Geisenheiner. Um, first of all, thank you for the nice introduction, Sven, and thanks, Neve, for yeah, laying out some of the questions already. Um, yeah, I would uh, like to give a little bit of a deeper background now on Plan S. I assume most of you are aware of it. If not, uh, this yeah is hopefully quite helpful. Um, just one quick sentence about the Royal Society of Chemistry. We are a professional body uh, existing since over 175 years. And we are there to advance the excellence in the chemical sciences. Plan is, yeah, it, uh, um, yeah. I have to say, popped up <laughs> last year. I think it was in, in May. Um, uh, and suddenly the world for yeah scientific uh, publishing yeah changed slightly or was 
quite disrupted because uh, um, suddenly there was a group of funders, and you will see them here, um, who are uh, yeah, asking the system to change the publishing system. So from a subscription system where people pay to read to a system where, where researchers pay to publish or institutions where researchers are based um, pay for publishing services, which is in general an idea to support, but as everything in life and as something like Neef described uh, with the idea of the PLUS funders, where are we after 16 years? Um, uh, it's not easy to, to fulfill. Um, but it wasn't just the uh, scientific publishers who had concerns about what Plan S was driving or trying to do and trying to do in a very, very short time frame. It was also um, uh, that researchers felt left out of the discussions and decisions at all. So there had been some, uh, yeah, op opponing positions and uh, an open letter initiated by Lynn Carmelin. Uh, she's uh, in Sweden, uh, a chemist as well, and uh, that uh, triggered a lot of attention and. It was also triggering Plan S and Coalition S, who is behind the plan, um, to, to really maybe not step back a little, but revise what they have originally planned. So they, uh, after talking to that group, they started to say, okay, we might need to review a couple of those things. We might need to ask for feedback to the plan to revise it. And um, that happened, actually. And that's very small, I think, uh, so difficult to read maybe. Um, one of the revisions were actually on how ho the whole funding part should work. What will be funded by those uh, signatories of that plan? And uh, what could be funded and what will not be funded? And that wasn't really clear in the first version and got much clearer in the second version, still leaving quite some questions. What does it mean if they can but don't have to? And what does it actually mean in the consequence for researchers? So as the Royal Society of Chemistry, we reacted to the first version of the plan. Um, and to say as a background, we have one of the largest open access journals in chemistry or the largest open access journal in chemistry, that's RSC Advances. The RSC itself has always been quite open-minded uh, towards open access. We flipped uh, one of our flagship journals already in 2016, it's a diamond version. So we, it's free to publish and free to read. The, the society is covering the costs. So our attitude towards open access was always positive. Um, so our reaction to the plan was that we in general agree with a lot of things in there. But we were also saying there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind uh, um, implementing such a plan. And that means to be, to, to be and stay pragmatic, pra pragmatic in, in some ways and uh, um, and not to, for example, put all the workload on researchers. I mean, they should do the research. They do, should uh, write their paper. And, but they should not be actually involved in all of the publishing processes in a way of funding processes, uh, which was really not clearly laid out here. Um, then what was really completely missing plan S is all, it's a very European view on things. And uh, as Sven mentioned, I'm also responsible for the Indian market. I've just been there uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago in, in longer discussions with librarians there um, and, and researchers. And there is simply no thinking of open access the way we do here in Europe. They like it if it's free 
but there's no funding available uh, uh, at all. So, and, and that's something you will see uh, in one of my next slides as well. Um, so there must be yeah, support in place for research everywhere globally to publish in high quality journals. And that's also something which is, um, if you look at the page of Plan S or Coalition S, you will hardly find anything around quality that seems like the whole quality issue of a journal Okay, impact factor, it's very controversial, but it is something researchers look at where to publish. It's completely left out by now in all of the discussions. Um, yeah, and, and at least also um, as a learned society, uh, and there are many of us around there, we are not just doing publishing. And yes, we need use our publishing revenue to really support other things we do which, if we are not existing anymore, nobody is going to do for, for researchers, like uh, networking events, early career uh, support. Um, what we do as a society is, for example, looking after uh, teaching chemistry, things like that. Who is going to do that in the future if that is not of value anymore? So as you can see, there are some... Uh, uh, positive and negative feedback from researchers as well. That's what we did. We went back to our community, to our over 50,000 members and said, hey, what are you thinking about it? Next to the fact that many were not aware about Plan S, but uh, there was actually some feedback about uh, open access and that makes it more visible or makes you as a researcher more visible, um, more access to the content. That's all uh, all on the positive side. But the impact of costs is always some, some of concern. So where, how do I pay that? Um, the international collaboration, which uh, is also an issue in, in chemistry at least, it's hardly that it's just one author from one institution or all authors from one institution. You have a very international authorship for one paper. How do, do you manage that? If you have people from, from China, they have a complete different view on where to publish because they get paid if they get uh, published in a high-impact factor journal. It's a complete different way of thinking. How do you manage things like that? So uh, what we as an RC intend to do is really to, to uh, yeah, Carry on asking the people what they think. Carry on asking the researchers what they want. Um, uh, we, we do regular surveys. We just have done and finished one um, two days ago. I have one more slide on that. Um, we, we are very agile about our positioning towards the changing landscape. And that's also something to say. There are, I don't have a number now, but there are thousands of funders globally and they all have different policies. How do you all adopt them? How do you get them all under one <laughs> single working policy? So you have to adapt and be very uh, agile on that. And, and keep the communication channel open in all directions. So it's not just the researchers or the f and the funders, but it's also the librarians who are as well in a middle seat to have a, a library budget and uh, to look at their own policies plus the funder policies plus what researchers want. So it's, it's also a challenging position. And, and that's what we uh, were trying to do today as well, like getting more engaged with, with the industry as well. What is their role in this new setup? Where can they play in? How can they support maybe like gaps we see in some territories? And that's really one, it's really just one slide out of our latest survey, like uh, who funds APCs? And that's different in uh, globally. So for example, in India, you can say uh, under others, that's also where people trying to pay their APCs themselves. 
because nobody is really from the from the institutional or funder side taking care of it or even being actually opponent against uh, open access as well like saying it's a bad thing because they made bad, bad experience with uh, with yeah Predator, uh, fake journals and um, so it's uh, it's it's a challenge for them so how can we maybe play together in this way to 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 either help them support uh, and uh, yeah keep the negotiate uh, the discussions and negotiations open so that's my input for today and uh, now I hand over to Sven and we open the discussion, I think. Thank you very much, Sibylle. There's good news for everybody. Uh, we made up for 10 minutes um, now, so we have 10 minutes more for your questions and for the conversation here, for the discussion. Uh, some very quick housekeeping. Um, I have asked the panelists to be as short as possible with their answers because it is quite a big panel as you can see uh, you should um, make sure that whenever you have a question uh, you jump in here because we are not just doing this for ourselves but ideally for all of you and thirdly there is a live stream that's why we need to use these microphones so that everybody who is not in this room but also involved in the conversation can make sure that he or she is being heard as well um, to get the panel up to speed a little bit, um, may I ask you as the audience, how many of you have already published any type of open access journal, book, chapter, or whatever? Can you raise your hand? So, okay, that's about 30%, I would say, 25 maybe. Okay, and um, whom of those, um, who of those found it difficult to acquire funding in the process, um, because funding is obviously one of the elements uh, that the research needs to take care of. Did you find it difficult to acquire funding for the publication of your article, which came up in both presentations now? Okay. <laughs> At least one not so positive experience, and that might be really interesting for our conversation. So let me kick off the conversation with uh, Santosh sitting next to me with one question um, that might be a little bit provocative, but nevertheless, Santosh, why should the industry care about open access? Why is this not something that universities, libraries, and researchers in these situations can deal with, but why is it for GSK and other companies an important issue? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks for the invitation. Um, I think it's a pleasure to be here. And, and uh, uh, thanks also for uh, Niem and Sibyl for a nice presentation. Um, well, why is it crucial for industry? I mean, I think it, in my opinion, it doesn't matter research whether it comes from industry or uh, elsewhere. Uh, being open, being transparent is quite key. So open access in that sense provides the accessibility. So uh, I suppose uh, in that sense, it's good in general. Now, within GSK, why does it, uh, why is it so key for us? Well, because we believe it supports one of our key values, and that's the transparency, the accessibility. So the GSK research, uh, that's conducted, we have a commitment to disclose the research in different formats, but also definitely in the peer-reviewed format for all randomized trials. And also beyond that, where there is a, where there is a need and it would address a scientific gap. So in that sense, uh, publishing behind paywall means not providing the accessibility so I guess in that sense, uh, we believe it's a very important to have it open for everyone to be available. Thank you. And I think it makes sense to add, I alluded to that already when um, um, basically introducing Valerie. Valerie, you have worked for different companies uh, and always had to do with publication um, issues, let me put it that way. Um, what is your, your perspective, and I have to walk over here, what is your perspective on open access and why should the industry care? 
Thank you, Sven. So I actually worked at the bench for my first company, so not always in publication. <laughs> but yeah, um, the last 15 years, definitely in medical communication groups in their various small, medium-sized biotech, and then you know bigger pharma. Um, so Takeda is a large pharma, obviously, um, just like we're a Shire this year. So I'm actually coming from the Shire side of the organization. We're now part of the Takeda group of family. Uh, of companies, and uh, we, Shire, uh, developed a lot of um, um, medication for like very rare disease. So we are always very patient-centric and very transparent as well. Transparency was like one is one of our value as well. We're one of the first company to really have like you know summary of clinical studies on our website for each of the clinical trial, as well as like plan language summary, so patient and patient advocate could also read uh, the result. And you know we've been sharing uh, data by having system for third-party researcher to access our data and do their own research. So transparency has been really important. And then we believe, in addition, you know, the acceleration of the dissemination of data uh, ultimately advance medical care and, uh, you know, improve patient care. And again, coming for, from a company that deeply cared about, you know, speeding up the uh, patient's journey to diagnosis, being in open access was really key. Um, so going for, you know, those... Um, especially pediatric patients, takes a long time for parents to get the final diagnosis of kids having, you know, those very rare genetic uh, disorders. And for the pediatrician, being able to access, you know, clinical trial or information is really important and has a direct impact on patient care. So, which is why, you know, we basically were the first from a company to mandate open access for all our publications starting uh, in January 2018 for all of the research that was funded uh, and generated by Shire. So internally as well as externally, you know, we are, like many companies provide funding for external research as part of our contract. We added, you know, like needed to like basically publish in open access because that's, that's really key. Just want to add as well, both Santos and Aria, our company are part of an open pharma group which also, you know, care deeply about open science. Uh, and, you know, it's no surprise that the two of us are here today because we have been really on the forefront of uh, really opening pharma. Yeah, thank you. Tobias, maybe um, you as a representative of a more traditional, if I may call it like that, more traditional open access funder, which is also probably a new term in open access, that it's getting traditional by now. Um, how do you see the involvement, the growing involvement of industry, and um, where do you see, sim see similarities and differences in your own behavior as a funder of open access or research through open access? So, well, maybe I'd start with uh, two key arguments um, in this regard. We at the SNSF spend public money. So we spend a billion Swiss francs every year. And the results that come out of the research we enable obviously have to be publicly available to the taxpayer who paid for it. That's key, and that's not going away anymore. <laughs> the second part is um, openness is the normal mode of operation in science. A few decades ago, there still was an issue of disseminating knowledge and research, and it was difficult. Then along came digitization, and now we have to reap the benefits. And any barrier to anyone who wants to access a scientific result is, in this sense, dysfunctional to the scientific system itself and cannot be accepted any longer. When it comes to the involvement of other private actors, I would like to raise the question of infrastructure as a whole. Since um, if we look at publishing from a funding perspective, publishing is a service that can be provided by the private sector that has costs involved and that need to be catered for, which um, the system in itself is struggling to find a way to do in a reasonable, sustainable way right now. But I think there are enough options on the table to go in this direction. And an involvement of industry, of knowledge-driven industry, I personally see mostly in a kind of enabling dissemination infrastructure, for example, when it comes to preprints, when it comes to the larger realm of open science in general. So how do we enable this? How do we get those interested in the knowledge integrated into the processes that are happening? Thanks a lot. Um, now, since we agree too much here on this panel already, uh, I would say, uh, why don't we ask Robert as the researcher, um, the representative of those um, uh, groups basically that we do all this for, I assume. Um, do you have the uh, impression, Robert, that 
um, it's really catered to your needs, whether publishing is a knowledge industry or a service industry or whatever it might be in the end. So where do you as a researcher see the central challenges when it comes to funding, but also to other ex uh, elements of open access in your daily work and what you see with your colleagues here at ETH and probably also at other institutions? Yeah, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for inviting me. So it's a pleasure and I really enjoy also listening to the interesting insights. Um, well, from a research perspective, it's very clear. We want to publish the research that we do that should be excellent in excellent high reputation journals. And that's maybe then already one of the difficult points that comes to um, open access sometimes. But obviously, we also don't want to do that only for the sake of, well, doing research and, and getting um, recognition in our own community, but we also want that people read what we do and learn from the build up on that. And that is very important also to highlight f for me personally, that it's not only in open access, but in open science perspective. So the data, software and so on, it's very crucial for us to also share in very transparent and easy to do ways. Um, so, so this is important um, for us to reach a wider community. And if we are in a high reputation university, we also want to be seen um, globally with our work. Another point for me where this transparency, openness, accessibility issue comes in um, is also that we want to inspire something to happen based on our results. And my particular field is uh, also agriculture policy. So we also do policy evaluations and we, we have a, a high incentive also to communicate research results to stakeholders that are not necessarily the, the key actors uh, subscribing to academic journals. Um, and obviously it increases our credibility, transparency, if we can provide access also to the underlying uh, kind of fundamental research behind our conclusions and policy recommendations. So also keep in mind, not necessarily this institution that maybe not read journal articles on a daily basis, um, but there are people that should um, get access to. So for us, it's an important um, add-on for my group. Personally, we really are um, dedicated to open access in the sense of trying to, to be as open as possible, simply because it's uh, for our own benefit. But um, very important for me is also that it comes potentially with some cost, because if you have to start looking for funding, looking how to do what and how to use a repository in a simple way, then it's costly. And um, well, we, uh, as a researcher, um, shouldn't um, spend too much of our time on searching for things uh, and also have in mind that um, like for me, I have a long-term vision on science and the science I'm doing, but I also have staff members that just stay in academia for three years or so, and they have very different goal functions, not necessarily aiming for the bigger something, but basically they do their stuff now, and their incentive to um, put something in a repository is, let's say, small. Um, uh, and, and we also really have to take into account that people on the ground are doing research and are the, the acting people that, that have to feed the system. Um, and we have to find ways to make it attractive um, for all the actors, bring in their knowledge and actions. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think what uh, Tobias just mentioned was a very interesting element of saying that it should be uh, should go without saying that what is pu funded publicly is also available um, to the public. I think all taxpayers in this room, and I assume that's almost everybody, um, can agree to that. And yet at the same time, um, this change in the paradigm has put quite some pressure on the system of publishing and also out of uh, libraries over the last 20 years. Raphael, maybe you can say from your perspective, um, because libraries have always been funded publicly uh, through different channels, at least the majority. Um, so what does this, what does open access change when it comes to serving the research community within one of the top institutions in research in Europe at the ETH and at other places? What does it change and how do you guys need to reconfigure the collaboration also of industry-funded research and publicly-funded research that is happening at the institutes, for example, of the ETH. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think it is uh, very important that Philip told us uh, one billion uh, Swiss francs or dollars, I don't know, Swiss francs, you spend for um, 
um, for research, uh, and it's wonderful that he told us. And uh, I can imagine, or, or I can I can tell you, uh, the oldest and most successful open access institution is the library, and the research uh, uh, activities, uh, the research results are available because we are libraries since 500 years. So it is nothing new that you can say we have, we want that it is publicly available because it is taxpayer, taxpayer money. So we want open access. Open access is the only thing to get uh, things available. This is not uh, true. And I think we have to uh, um, uh, remember that um, these institutions uh, like libraries and information centers are available and were available and are available to make research results to make um, the, the ideas of the researchers uh, available, to organize it, to structure it, uh, to archive it, to curate it, uh, and uh, make it available also for the future. So this is a, a comment uh, or a small remark on, on this idea that uh, open access is something new and the only way because um, the results were hidden behind a wall. This is not true. It was hidden behind a paywall, and of course we have uh, paid for this uh, results, but uh, it is available and will be available even if open access comes or not. And of course your question, Sven, is uh, very important because uh, libraries are prepared uh, for the open access world. Libraries are able to support uh, even uh, if they pay for licensing or if they will organize and help paying for APCs management. Uh, the question is indeed uh, how to structure the information. This is one of our um, um, important topic we, we, we struggle with actually uh, because uh, we make in the, in the scientific community only big deals. So uh, this means we uh, license uh, to everything. That means uh, we pay for everything. The authors can access to everything. Uh, everything is open access. And as you remember, the uh, uh, publisher of um, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Frank Schirmer, told us uh, a few years uh, ago, uh, for, um, for all you can eat, uh, the body has to pay, but for all you can read, our mind. And this is one of uh, an aspect which we uh, shouldn't... Uh, uh, ignore because the structuring of the information, uh, the the organization of uh, the uh, literature, uh, the access to it, to the, the seamless connectivity uh, in a consistent system is organized uh, via libraries and it uh, should be organized via libraries in the future even if there is uh, things available uh, via open access or not. Uh, but the second question is, and I'm a little bit concerned about the contribution of financing partners, uh, as I told in my uh, welcome address, um, I think uh, this is a lot of money, uh, uh, Philip, uh, the taxpayer in Switzerland, uh, invested in research and um, in, in funding. Uh, but the, pub, the industry, the research industry, benefits now from open access available information and literature. Uh, before this time, the... Uh, the contribution of the pharmaceutical industry, of the chemical industry, was relevant. It was uh, estimated 30% of the overall all revenues of Elsevier was made by the private research companies. And this contribution now you have to pay, uh, Philip, and the taxpayer has to pay because the research uh, industry uh, and uh, Novartis and other companies in Switzerland will say, wonderful, our, uh, the results are freely available, we will benefit, and this is wonderful. So it is a new kind of double dipping, and instead of uh, being... Uh, uh, angry on the publishing industry, now we have to ask the, in, um, the research industry what is their contribution to financing a publication system which is switching from, open act, from, from, from licensing financing to, to APC financing. That's why we are always together on um, panel discussions. It's always getting interesting with uh, Raphael on these kinds of uh, instances. Uh, so I think we have made up uh, several new elements here. Before we dive into the first round of uh, discussions, and I see there are already questions there, I would like to finish off this round on um, the funding elements with one of the two representatives of the publishers. And maybe, Sibylle, because you highlighted it in your presentation, you can um, speak to that. You said that the Royal Society of Chemistry and many other um, society publishers in the world um, take a part of the receipts uh, from the publishing activities to fund other activities. Um, now, I was part of a 
conversation at the MIT a few months ago, and their librarian said, yes, but we don't want to fund that. We just want to fund the service around the content, whatever that might mean. Um, and um, I think that also goes into a, a situation where we are seeing a kind of fragmentation right now. Uh, in the past, there was a library world, a funder world, basically, and a publisher world. And it was relatively easy to organize these funding streams. Now it's getting a little bit more complicated um, in this process. Um, Raphael alluded to the free riders, as the industry has been seen in open access for quite some time now, I would say. My impression is that this panel is going into another direction. We are seeing that uh, industry um, is participating also in the funding and for its own reasons um, and not just to be uh, nice corporate citizens or whatever. So how do you see the perspective on the publishing side of being transparent and also being um, focused on the service of publishing and probably finding other funding um, um, sources for other activities a society does because that might be a relevant uh, request as well from those who fund. I'm responsible for my mic, <laughs> I was told. Um, a lot of questions. Indeed, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just. Could, I will not do it uh, again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but first, I have to uh, reply to Raphael as well. I don't think libraries are prepared. Some of them are prepared, but there are a lot of libraries which are actually still not prepared. In those discussions I have uh, with with uh, on a countrywide level, I can say some of them are still like sitting. I'm not sure if this is an English saying, <laughs> but sitting like the rabbit in front of a snail. Can you say that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Um, so it's. Uh, I don't think that the whole world is prepared, and that's the other. The other question, and that's maybe to you, Tobias. What is a taxpayer? Is there something like a global taxpayer? I mean. There's n it's not. So if the Swiss taxpayer says they want to read the Swiss, <laughs> Swiss research results, okay. But what gives them the right to read the Chinese research results? That's the idea you can say, okay, that's the idea of open access and everybody should yeah, read everything. But that really relies on a complete different level. Is the globe prepared <laughs> for open access to really buy into each other? I don't I don't see that actually not in the in the political <laughs> sense we have right now. But that's another question. Now one of your five questions is <laughs> when I don't know. That's the There's beauty, you can choose one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and maybe maybe it's the one where I actually don't really have an answer to it's um we we as learned society have been in in quite a comfortable situation for a while uh, in like being seen as a non for profit good organizations doing something good uh, for the research and suddenly uh, out of this that gets completely questions in a way but it get questions out of a ecosystem from those people who actually not uh, um, yeah, have getting the goods out of it because that's in fact the researchers. So it, I think actually it is also a discussion institutions need to have with their researchers. Do you actually really value what that organization is doing for you? Do you see that? Is that something we should buy into? Maybe that could be a different way of financing things on all, all that, but just to switch it off and hope that somebody else will finance the cost. It's simply not possible. And it's especially not possible just by increasing membership or, or trying to find more members or things like that. That's not how it works, or actually one one other thing could be indus industry funding for certain things as well. That's maybe something where, where the industry could step into in saying, okay, uh, we see the value of, of you as a society and what you do and the platforms you give us to, uh, or even even the, 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 the 
yeah, people you develop, we can employ later. So maybe there is some possibility of trying to, to find new funding models. The question is always the sustainability behind it. It's like, uh, is that a one-time off? Is that something you can rely on for a certain period? Or uh, if suddenly the money gets tight in the industry again, is that gone? What happens then? Um, so, But I could imagine that this is at least something to talk about. You know that we can continue this discussion just with ourselves for the next four hours, <laughs> which we are not going to do. Santosh has a very quick um, um, opportunity to answer, and then I want to open for a first round of questions because I think it's really important to answer your questions here. You can't preach openness and then be close. But Santosh, please go ahead. I mean, it's not so much an answer. Uh, it's just to kind of bring, at least from the GSK's perspective, Preparedness indeed is important. I mean, it does cost. Someone has to pay. But from our side, for us, that preparedness comes from the fact that we have this transparent requirement and then and the will willingness to publish make it transparent. So we include the potential cost. So that that's already foreseen. So I guess planning up front and preparing for that including the cost would already kind of help you, uh, you know, sort of what you can anticipate. So that's one part. And the second part is also that some for us, um, partly it's not so much that we want to be prepared and we are ready, but it's more a challenge from the publisher side when we even want to make uh, a, a manuscript uh, openly available to all. Uh, it's not feasible. I mean, definitely, or at least when it comes from the industry-funded research, uh, perhaps uh, maybe you are aware that not all publishers, um, maybe not those who are in the panel, but not all publishers uh, have the same uh, accessibility or uh, for uh, providing open access to industry-sponsored research. So barriers don't just exist with the funders, but also on the other side. Now it's getting really interesting, and we will still get that as a, use that as a starting point for the second round of the panel discussion. So obviously, libraries are not prepared, industry is not prepared, and publishers neither. I hope that at least researchers are prepared. So we'll see. <laughs> but here's the first question. Um, please just tell us who you are and. Hi, I'm Jasada. So I work for a publisher, a Cogger in Switzerland. I have a question from the publisher point of view. Why, you know, I appreciate the discussion about, you know, different model moving beyond author pays or, or uh, national funding agency pay to industry sponsorship. So how do we as publisher ensure that the public will understand that there's no perceived conflict of interest when you have industry partnership, which is a healthy thing? How do we have a healthy discussion and partnership around this. Valerie, you need a mic, okay. Thank you. So let's talk about disclosure. Because <laughs> those are really the question that makes the front page of the New York Times <laughs> once in a while, uh, whether it's from the uh, academia or industry, bioscience, even the the guideline on like, you know, uh, the meat uh, recently, just a few weeks ago, there was something again about, you know, uh, a publication that uh, was picked up, was about guideline and, you know, what's a healthy diet and was picked up and made the front page of, front page of the New York Times because um, even though the, I can't remember what journal that was published, but the journal asked for like three years of disclosure, financial, etc., which the author complied and somebody was like, well, five years ago, you did receive money from a meat company and you didn't disclose that. So, you know, there is, in the same way, there's very different rules. We know the founders have different rules, the publisher have different rules for like, you know, open access, access. Um, but there's also many different rules about disclosure. So what is the relevant disclosure and how far back do you go? I think the public has definitely uh, uh, changed a lot, you know, recently. They want to have more transparency and more. And it's actually something uh, certainly where, you know, that's like our daily job. Santosh and I, it's like making sure we have, you know, very transparent and full disclosure. And it's sometimes really hard to get that from, uh, you know, all the authors internally and externally. There is still some, you know, I don't want to 
we perceive that bias. We are biased from, you know, our own, you know, cultural heritage and, you know, <laughs> et cetera. So I think it's being transparent and there is definitely uh, some room there for like more, um, you know, guidelines around what should be disclosed, how far back you go. And, you know, not just the, uh, the money disclosure, but also, you know, the, we worked for and, you know, it's beyond the patent and, and so on. So there is definitely uh, something for many stakeholders to sit around and, and, and discuss. So. Yeah, I kind of uh, totally in line with Valerie. Just if I may add, you, as long as the intent is clear, uh, I think the conflicts of interest is a matter of kind of, you know, be transparent and then highlight it. So there is no conflict of interest, but as long as you know what the intent, why you're doing it. So in this case, being transparent, I, I, I guess it's the right thing to do, so. But maybe a quick remark from the research perspective, because you ask, like, are researchers prepared? And I, I still highly doubt it. So I see that as a very interesting idea of uh, money flowing into um, open science uh, movements coming from industry, and that makes perfectly sense, but don't underestimate the issues arising. It's not only disclosure issues, but conflict of interest also, but having an like attachment to a particular company doing research, publishing in a journal that is financed by Syngenta or so, well, that that gives some flavor. Um, and in the end, and what I talked about is not only doing research for the sake of research, but also communicating it to the public, communicate, communicating it to policymakers, that's going to be very, very hard. And it's not sufficient to be transparent and saying, well, this is the money, well, that's coming from that company, but it's never having a say in any part of the process. It's not going to be sufficient. There's always going to be some flavor. And uh, like for me personally, what I like listen to today, I see uh, a, a big role to play in detaching some processes that are on the front line of publishing to providing some infrastructure. And that was one of the points that we talked about. Um, so this is maybe there are roles, but then it really has to be clearly detached from um, this publication process because there, there is something left over in any case. So. Tobias, I was to ask you anyways, um, because you are representing one of the most experienced funders when it comes to open access, do you see an issue uh, like uh, this with disclosure that differentiates between open access and paywalled content? Um, so can you not be uh, blind on one eye as a researcher when you publish in a paywall journal as much as you publish in an open access journal? So is there, isn't there a subtle message of saying as soon as the publisher receives money from the side of the researcher that they might have different quality standards. Um, so how do you see that in your funding policy? Would you say that open access is, um, when it comes to these issues, inferior to paywalled content? Not at all, and I'm, I really have an issue of uh, finding a connection of this specific challenge to open access at all. Mm -hmm. So it's also present in, in subscription journals as well. And I think um, this all breaks down to quality assurance. The quality assurance process of a publisher has to be transparent. It has to pick up on the best practices available in the field. And given we are talking about open science, it has to pick up on opening up different aspects in there to not be able to only state we do our review independently, but to point to the evidence that the re review, for example, was done independently. Thank you. There's a question from what Twitter, the live stream, or whatever, and Sarah. No, it was my question actually. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so Sarah Ruhi from Plus. Um, to a couple of points. So yeah, I was wondering if you know something like open peer review uh, could really help ameliorate some of the concerns about conflicts of interest regarding um, uh, sponsorships or relationships with uh, with industry. To, I don't want to derail by going back to um, Raphael's point about libraries being ready, but agreeing with Sybil, I wanted to raise the point that in the United States, um, libraries have almost no relationship with open access funding in the sense that they don't provide centralized streams uh, funding the way you typically do in Europe, particularly in the UK. And so I think that is a very concrete case of a regional difference um, that is really tripping up kind of the, the approach to Plan S um, and compliance, uh, certainly in, in North America. 
May, may I ask a, a, a question? Yes, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you. Not every library is uh, prepared to this process, and not every library is allowed to be partner of this process. And this is a next consequence of the strictly open access and open science situation that uh, in this uh, transformation, a lot of stakeholders could be kicked off the system. And at the end, we have only the funders and we have the researchers. Perhaps it is enough that the funders say what we want and what you do, and the researchers make research and made it in an open science environment which is available for everyone and completely free, uh, accessible. But on the other hand, I told a few arguments why it is necessary and in my opinion um, have a very big benefit when the complete stakeholder chain is um, also available in the future because they, they, they contribute with their special competencies uh, and uh, to this uh, product, research, information, results of research and, and science. And this is what I, what I see, and of course, and not everyone is prepared, Sibylle, uh, but on the other hand, we discussed, Sven told us, who is prepared? Uh, and I am a little bit afraid, and it is, uh, it is a kind of emotional approach, I guess the funders are prepared. The only stakeholder in this situation is the funders, and this is a new monopolist in the system. Uh, we all fight against monopolists like Elsevier, Springer, and uh, Wiley, uh, and this was one of the drivers in the open access movement, and this was the market approach. But now we have an institutional monopolist. Funders often put them up in a situation where they decide with their money, and I'm very, I, I, I find it great that Philip says very um, self-consciousness, we decide this, we have the tax pay money, uh, pay money. Uh, you can make this and that. You as the Swiss National Science Foundation decide what you can research. Are you still free to decide what you want to uh, uh, research, what you want to find out? Are you still free in teaching? And Philip tell you where you have to publish, in which format you have to publish. Otherwise, you say, no money, Robert. Oh, sorry, there is another one who will make it publicly available, open access, and what else. Uh, and this is, in my opinion, a question we also have discussed in the uh, questions or in the, in the discussion on open access. What is the position of the for, of the funding agencies. And there are different positions in the world. There are funding agencies which are more defensive. There are funding agencies which are more aggressive and more monopolist. But I think this is a new fear and a new danger. And I'm a little bit uh, afraid of it. Uh, instead of having market monopolists, they have institutional monopolists which decide where the science has to go. Well, you can see that freedom of speech is a very important element also in uh, academic conversations like this. But let's uh, not uh, ask Tobias first whether he agrees with this perspective, but rather, um, uh, but rather Robert, is there any limitation on how you research and publish when it comes to open access from the Swiss, Na Swiss National Science Fund or any other funder? <laughs> Um, I do hold grants from the Swiss National Science Foundation. I'm happy about it, <laughs> thankful. Uh, we have a good collaboration. I don't feel uh, kind of like heavy pressure. Um, no, but indeed, I mean, this is this is obviously also with, uh, with uh, grants from Horizon 2020 or similar. Like you have this, in that sense, burden of 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 uh, having restrictions, how to publish, and 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 being careful and. Um, also setting up budgets in in the way that you that you have these open access uh, fees then incorporated, um, and obviously for me as professor at ETH is uh, super super easy compared to people in other European countries and in particular compared um, to researchers that are not um, in privileged uh, situations and countries. So uh, this is this is indeed a very tricky point. Um, and I guess there have to be some some middle ways uh, of of uh, kind of like you now we had diamond, uh, golden, but also green is an important component, and there are middle ways that are do make sense from both perspective. And I wouldn't forget about these. Uh, this is important, and I also liked your point with the open open review comments. So indeed, that what I meant with open science is is kind of like transforming stuff, and we have to be transparent in in all directions, and um, whether that 
I guess that that solves many of the issues. Maybe not all. Um, that's one of the financing, but it's really also important to to keep down the the burden for researchers. And whenever you feel kind of like constraints, it's 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 a burden. It's a cost, and you don't go that way. So just to to, to signal also that um, publisher attractive um, that funding attractiveness uh, is not only the amount of money, but also the amount of uh, duty that is coming with it um, and there are huge differences not only for publishing but also other things and that is important yeah, yeah i think we are now at a very interesting point um to finish that um which is the motivation for open access publishing so we have seen now different motivational structures um and uh, one of that is obviously to make the obligation to make something open because um, everybody, like the public, has paid for it. Now, within companies, there are obviously taxpayers, but there are also shareholders, uh, which uh, let's assume for the moment, uh, for the, the sake of the argument, that the shareholders have an interest in the financial well-being of the company. I think that's fair to say. Um, so, um, And what I find interesting is that there is very little visibility of research, open access research activity and publication activity of the industry, in this concert of open access. So how do your shareholders react to openness and to you spending money on publications, more money, I assume, um, on that side, on the publishing side than you did in the past? And is that the next cost item, which I think is one of the concerns that will be removed when there is a dip in the financial performance of the company? So how sustainable is open access funding by the industry? Um, how would the stake, uh, shareholders react? I am afraid I don't think I can answer it. But what I perhaps can kind of gather is that our um, encouragement to publish open access and then to sort of plan it in advance and budget the potential costs uh, for open access uh, has not been sort of challenged. Uh, irrespective of what you want to call as a performance of the company, uh, financial performance, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, that being said, uh, we do benchmark in terms of trying to understand one of the challenges of uh, publishing industry is also about there is no cap in terms of the publication cost, uh, as even APC included. So why do we do that? Well, obviously, uh, it's also uh, interesting to kind of budget it, so plan it advance. And the second point is, there is we, perception is also a very key. I mean, Valerie would second that as well for industry. So we don't want to be perceived as we are paying just to get a, an article published. So that's why we do have a benchmarking across journals, publishers, and, and it's like a systematic exercise. Uh, with that being said, so there is no severe pushback. In fact, we strongly uh, are sort of encouraged to recommend authors to publish open access. And if we just go back with the figures, with our broad transparent requirements and the disclosure requirements uh, with GSK, we have had, uh, without a mandating policy to publish open access, uh, we have more than 80%, of a vast majority of it, being published uh, as open access, or at least some form of freely accessible uh, journal. So that, that sort of speaks for the company commitment. Uh, did that answer? You did. OK. Thank you. Um, yes, on the, uh, the Shire side of the Takeda organization, certainly we were already publishing in open access before we rolled out our open access policy. We're about, I think, 70, 75 percent of open access because we always encourage that. Obviously, uh, I, that number went up. Uh, and, you know, in the first year, obviously, there was some... Uh, um, manuscripts that were submitted, you know, the year prior published in 2018. So it wasn't 100 percent, you know, obviously from the get go. But as far as funding, uh, certainly the uh, the mandate to publish in open access came from the medical side of the organization. But, you know, the senior leaders had to really convince and, you know, 
talk to everybody in uh, in the R and D uh, organization as well as legal, and we uh, um, even you know in medical provided funding for our colleagues in discovery research that may not have you know the fund to publish in open access. And in the same way, with all our collaborators, uh, we do a lot of collaborative studies with uh, uh, academia. We also you know fund uh, the you know um, that that piece as well. So it was a decision internally to again you know push the transparency and uh, uh, be a, you know open for mind and do this. May I ask a question to the representatives of the publishing houses here on the table and uh, as well as to you, Robert. Uh, we, we discussed uh, the, the new role of libraries uh, in the new publication process and I guess this is a very interesting role and I'm sure we are prepared, especially we as the ETH library. I'm not sure if every library on the world is prepared, but the, my question is, is the publication process at the background of open access too much complicated, made by you as the publishers, that uh, the scientists are not able to fulfill all these requirements automatically. Uh, th there are a lot of stakeholders now in this publication chain, uh, and the library, we as ETH Library, uh, build up uh, new services to support the publishers, to support, not the publishers, to support the publication process, to help the researchers, to help the students to understand and make this process available. Because this process is much more complicated. The funders have some regulars uh, which we have to fulfill, the scientists have to fulfill, the publication platforms are very complex and diverse, and the scientists uh, sit before this uh, interface and said, what? what to do, here is a new formula, here is something to check in, here is a credit card available uh, and necessary and what else. And this is what we as libraries uh, pick up and say, this is perhaps our new role, not only organizing information and literature since uh, 500 years, but now helping the actors, the scientists in this new publication role. But at the same time, we see uh, the publication systems are much co more complicated than 20 years ago. There is no direct help, there is no personal uh, support, there is an automatic interface. Uh, perhaps you can help uh, to make this publication process as a publisher's more smooth, that the scientists can publish easier and uh, more efficient. So, <clears throat> so let me comment uh, on that, and I have a couple of comments relevant to this from the, the previous discussion. Um, so I would say in many ways, the publication process is the same as it has been kind of always. I, I don't think, certainly speaking from an editorial perspective, um, and I think this goes back to, to the earlier question of whether the source of funding changes how that, you know, whether it's a funder or industry or somebody else paying. Um, from an editorial perspective, Open access journals work in the same way as subscription journals. They have the same high quality editorial standards. The business model on which a journal works does not determine its editorial quality. Its editorial quality is a feature of the journal and the editors who work on the journal, the reviewers who are part of the review process, um, and journals that have editorial boards, then it's also a feature of the, you know, the editorial board from that research community that really makes the quality standard of that journal. Um, I can certainly speak for PLOS and any other publisher where I have worked, and certainly all of the quality journals, whether they are open access or subscription journals, the people making those editorial decisions are not responsible for the financial health of the journal. And this is really important. And as publishers, we put a huge amount of effort into ensuring that there is no financial pressure on the people making the decisions about whether or not a particular article is suitable for publication. That is an editorial decision, and it is taken entirely based on the editorial standards of the journal and how good or not the paper is. And I think a huge part of this comes down to the importance of... So I would, I would argue very strongly that actually it's not just funders and researchers can make the process work like you suggested could be the case, Raphael. Um, because I think it really matters that you have an independent, community-led group of people who are involved in... in allowing the community to assess the research that's interesting for the community. And I think that's done through editors and reviewers and really looking at what's suitable to publish. I think when it comes back to the question, um, really about kind of whether 
publishers can then make a process easier. Maybe what you're asking about is whether the payment part can be easier. And I think it is fair to say that when everything or most things worked in a subscription model, then usually those negotiations or payments happened between perhaps a library and a publisher. And so individual kind of researchers who were publishing articles didn't have to think very much about that part. That is different in an APC-funded model in some cases, depending on how the APCs are paid for. So firstly, I will say, I think APCs are where we are now. I think we need to be careful not to think that they are the answer to how we fund publications. I think they are just a step on the way to working out how to make this work really well. But I think it's really important that we don't assume that they have to be the answer forever. Um, and I would also argue that actually a lot of publishers do offer some help. Perhaps we could be more obvious about the fact that it's there. But certainly I think it's pretty clear for most publishers, our aim is to help researchers and enable people to share their research and find the information they need to make the discoveries that they got into this for in the first place. We aim to make that as simple as possible. Simply because it's your lifeline, right? It is not <laughs> even... No. <laughs> a, a, short, a short remark. <laughs> uh, it's not only the publication and, and financing process. 52 hours a year, a researcher spent for formatting the layout of his oh, yeah. or her paper. This is too much, and this is your job to do it. Uh, yes, so I think you should be able to submit format free. You can do that with the RSC. You can do that with us. You make it simple. Just send your paper in. Make it as simple as possible. But but it does, this doesn't matter, like mm, whether sure. this is open access or not. Exactly. So in, indeed, indeed. But m making the process easier for researchers is uh, it, is is also in the end sparing time for research. And this is mm -hmm. this is I guess very important to have in mind. So I also would add there is no extra burden of uh, publishing in an open access way. Indeed, there might be some additional cost of, of going to a full-fledged open science component, but I wouldn't say that there is an, um, like in that sense, this burden that we have to make that way. We have to, as researchers also, like we are fully engaged in the process, so we just need a good support from like parties like ETH Library to go that way. So in that sense, it's it's just the way that we go, and and we have to be supported on that way. Maybe one quick remark back to this financing thing. I, I fully agree that there is no financial pressure on a single article basis, but still, I I would raise the doubts that not all journals that are around are uh, basically uh, as attractive or similarly attractive um, from a industry financing point of view. So just to signal, there are also disciplines in science that are absolutely crucial for us that are not having a payoff within the next five or 10 or 15 years that are just there because it's science. And it's also relevant to have disciplines that are um, maybe not as attractive uh, for funding bodies outside of the taxpayer money. So just have in mind that also this, this financing model can, can shut off some of the uh, parts of science that are crucial uh, for us as scientists in general, but maybe not so crucial for a particular industry within the next years. And there I would really signal also that it's not only the, 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 the short-term shale or the value that is created, but there's also like a corporate social responsibility component to it. And then again, we are in a totally different world of saying, but I am going to finance uh, a journal that is on on uh, medicine, on uh, a particular uh, way of, of treating plant diseases, but it's more like a general chipping in money. And, and there I see a great benefit also from a social corporate sense responsibility perspective uh, without having this, this uh, well, this, this kind of like flavor attached to it. I knew it was a bad idea to manage shareholder to mention shareholder value with an economist at the panel, but uh, <laughs> I did it nevertheless. You see where that leads to. Um, but I think um, uh, we are in agreement. My point basically was that um, even shareholders need to be behind this. And if you think of other industries as well, if, if this is being done in, in a gray zone where shareholders don't really understand what's going on, it's probably not really opening it up and not really helpful. So I think it should be helpful and uh, it should be seen 
Um, and I think that's the, the beauty, if you want, if there is any beauty in shareholder value uh, theories. It's the beauty about that approach that people really calculate then very directly what is the impact short term for sure, but also longer term. And I think um, in our library and publisher world that's sometimes um, more like emotional. So there might be a value in 25 years uh, or not. And I think it's really important to also have um, companies, corporates um, in the game, uh, which have a different set of interests and motivations. And I think that became very clear here that that is there as well. I want to open um, the panel um, ideally for further discussion. Um, so if you use the live stream, um, please write your questions and we will um, bring them into the group here. Um, so no reason to just have the conversation, just have the conversation with people over here. But are there questions right now? I think there was one in the back. I'll try to make sure that you have the mic, otherwise people don't hear you. Oh, that's easy. So we meet in the middle. <laughs> So I have actually two questions to each of the panelists, but it can be answered with <laughs> this one word only. It has to be answered in one word, a number, and yes or no. So the first question is, how much money do you think industry is paying annually for having access to scientific information? Just a ballpark figure. And the second question is, do you think it's a problem if this money is missing in the system? Fair enough. Where do we start? Well, can, can I start by saying I, I don't know the answer to what the figure is, you exceeded but your I words know it's already. a pretty big number. And yes, I think it's a problem if it's missing. Um, I, would, I don't know a number either. <clears throat> I would say from a publisher perspective, it depends on the publisher. There are some, uh, um, some yeah, publishers where I think the income from the industry or not public institution is much higher if you just look at law publishers, for example, or maybe even economics, I could imagine. Uh, that's a complete dif different topic. Uh, chemistry is different. Medi medicine, I mean, if you look at all the hospitals, <laughs> which are not public, uh, I assume that's a big sum from there as well. So yes, I would agree uh, with you as well. It's an, it's an issue. So if you visit the international conferences, and um, this is a question that's really interesting in driving this, the community uh, everywhere. And one number that gets mentioned sometimes, it's uh, around 10 to 15 percent of the revenue coming from outside of academia overall. And picking up on the numbers um, pointed out by Raphael pr uh, previously of this 30 percent of Elsevier's revenue coming from private, uh, one question I would have in this particular case is, so what, since Elsevier has a 33% profit margin on all of this? And how are this 30%, if they are the correct number, benefiting research and researchers? There are other numbers around, for example, a recent study, a landscape analysis published by Spark in September, mentioned that 12.5% of costs could be decreased in the publishing system by a publisher if they go fully open access and strip the cost of litigation and uh, preventing people from accessing publications in the first place. So the discussion is, of course, difficult since there are heterogeneous um, contexts and disciplines and publishing practices and efforts put in there differ by context as well as by publisher and the services provided. But if it would be a big hit to lose this uh, private revenue is a really open question. And the revenue is different as well <laughs> from publisher to publisher. And I, I'm also going to qualify what I said. I don't think it's a problem. I mean, as a, my answer to the question wasn't, is it a problem for publishers? I think it's a problem for the whole system. I think the aim of this is to think about how we enable people to share their research and how everyone who does research contributes to that. And I think that's and who, who benefits from the research that's done. So I'm not answering that as a, you know, yes, it, it is a problem because we don't get the money. I think it's a problem because it means that other people have to cover those costs more. And the people, you know, as I think Santosh and, and Valerie have really outlined today, they are doing research as well and they are, you know, reading research and also publishing. And I think it matters 
that the people who are involved in benefiting from the system contribute to it. And that's why I think it's important. So very quickly from uh, the pharma side. So uh, indeed, you know, what what is a drop really in revenue from the publisher? And again, like the publishing world is so diverse that, you know, it's not a one answer fits all. But when we publish open access only, what really is a drop? Because the money going to publisher from pharma, it's also coming from the commercial arm of our organization that, you know, buy reprint. And we haven't seen, you know, it's been only two years at Shire since we mandated it. We haven't seen a drop or at least a significant drop in like our marketing colleagues getting reprint because they like those flashy <laughs> medical publication uh, reprints. So it's not necessarily, and you know, we obviously, we, we need more uh, to look into it more closely, but I'm not sure there will be like a direct change uh, or an immediate change with, you know, and, and how much of percentage, you know, uh, uh, the drop would be for the publisher um, if, you know, all pharma move into a, a more open access uh, um, model and again, you know, depending on the publisher, you know, small academic society would be a very different impact than a company like Elsevier, who is really big. But you know, just the point on Elsevier, we really try to engage with them because they are op offering open access uh, to many, um, you know, uh, to research by founder that do mandate it, but not pharma founder. So we, you know, just because of that, you know, we actually those journals that don't offer open access at all to us, we are stop publishing altogether in them. So. They are losing there, <laughs> for sure. Yes, I repeat my number. Estimated 30% of the overall revenue of, in the SCM market comes from commercial customers. And the second answer is, yes, this money is missing in the system. First question, I don't know. Second one, like I think industry... Um, is is an important component of the scientific uh, process and also the money flowing into it that is important um, but you have to be careful how to integrate it that, that is an important point so um, like whenever and and for me I don't personally see the point whether this has to come from subscription um, to journals or in another way so I, I believe that this money can be very very valuable for both sides um, but for me, it personally, it doesn't matter how the money flows into the system. Um, yeah, yeah, as far as numbers, I wouldn't know I, as well. I would wish to uh, sort of say it. I think, like Valerie mentioned, in terms of uh, reprints, indeed, there is quite a bit of money, uh, revenue as well. But on top of that, we, we being a commercial entity, reuse of materials, published materials, uh, for whether it's for non-commercial or commercial purposes, because we are a commercial entity, we will have to kind of uh, obtain copyright clearance, so which also kind of adds to it. So I would assume a lot. And also, uh, the the I just read recently that more than half of the biomedical research is nowadays carried out by industry or privately funded organizations, meaning that assuming all of them gets reported uh, eventually, uh, that should be a substantial amount. So for your second part of the question, yes, if it's missing, indeed, it's it, there is a problem, I would agree. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? So my name is Alexander Leitner. I'm a senior scientist at the Department of Biology here at ETH. So I was specifically coming back to the question of uh, industry and, 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 and commitment to, to open access funding. So um, I was expecting a little bit more progressive attitude here because I think the question that uh, industry uh, pays for publication charges, I think, is, 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 is not going to be a major uh, issue on the overall uh, fun financial situation of, of, of a big pharma company because I, I have no idea and I, as, uh, apparently you don't have either if, if, about the money that goes into, into APCs now from the industry point of view. But if you say, okay, a, a big pharma company publishes uh, maybe a thousand articles a year, that would be like a, a few million whatever dollars or, or euros or something. Um, compared to probably that several orders of magnitude more money goes into a, into advertisement, for example. 
So I would rather ask the question that came up very much in the beginning, that if, if industry is using a lot more uh, research that is becoming open access, isn't there a sort of more or less direct or indirect obligation to fund, to put money back into, this, into the open access system in, in another way, rather than through APCs, by funding initiatives that allow other researchers to publish open access, for example. I think this would be a more transformative commitment. I, I would like I would quickly like to add one element here, which is um, I think this whole idea of the free rider um, that uh, and there's always this claim that there are groups with commercial interests like the industry who is a free might be a free rider or not. So the question of the commitment. Um, if you look at the academic system and you look into different funding structures, you can by the way see exactly the same issue. So you can see that there are major libraries, for example, in the UK that spend disproportionately fewer budgets on open access funding of top universities than much smaller institutions uh, do as well. So I think we can even open the question up uh, also to Raphael and say, how much is, what is the usage? What's the benefit the institution gets out of it, whether it's commercial or not? And what is it giving back into the system? I think that's, that's probably an interesting element. But Santosh, please go ahead. Um, I don't think uh, we have only commercial interests for uh, disclosing the data. So, I mean, we have commitments to disclose data irrespective of whether a product is in the market or not. Even the very early phase, phase one uh, outcomes are also, we have commitment to submit to, uh, to a peer-reviewed journal to get it published. And hopefully in an open access, uh, as open access. That being said, um, how can we just fund it in a different way, contribute it? Well, uh, our transparency commitments for disclosing all the results is, is actually publicly known. We also encourage uh, investigators, uh, re external researchers, who uh, to pr submit proposals for research, and and uh, we fund that research where there is uh, where it's it's really uh, relevant, and then the and and uh, it's profound enough. And as part of their commitments, because we fund uh, the the research part, we also kind of sort of get back uh, the commitment from their side to publish their results. So yes, uh, definitely there could be other ways to do. So for us, research and then uh, patient care eventually is, is what is at heart. Commercial interest for certain groups will be there. We are, I mean, let's not forget a commercial entity, but our disclosure commitments uh, certainly doesn't uh, sort of come because of the commercial interests. Here's your question, uh -huh. Sven. I, I think I, I, I can uh, add a, a, a very simple uh, truth, uh, actually, what concerning the open access movement. Uh, the research intense universities will pay the price. This is very simple, uh, and they will, of course, they will benefit from having uh, open access publications, uh, but they have to pay for it. Uh, and the smaller universities and research institutions, which uh, are less uh, research uh, intense, will benefit from having access to all of it, but they contribute less than the bigger ones. This is a quite simple situation, and uh, we have to see this and have to find out solutions for financing it. And uh, but, but this is something new, and I, I think it is not unfair, but it is but it is something new, and you cannot decide as a library what you want to invest. So you cannot decide uh, to build up your collection or make it smaller and to, to organize your budget and uh, that what you can get from your money, but you have to pay for the APCs, uh, for the researchers, and this is uh, out of the hand of the library. So the libraries cannot act in a special way in the open access world. Uh, the researchers ha can act, they can publish more or less. So if you have no money in May of next year, please stop publishing because the APCs are not available for you. Uh, but we at the library are not able to help anymore. And this is a consequence of the open access switch. 
Robert, how does it sound to you as a researcher? Do you care whether the library builds a collection or whether you build the publication list? Isn't that the role of the library that they should serve your research projects rather than creating their own internal lives by building collections for eternity or whatever? No, no, but in, in general, obviously, that would be uh, that would be a pity and, a, and a, <laughs> a heavy burden to the process if something like that happens. But um, now we are smiling, but basically that's reality from the other point as well. So uh, many researchers don't have access uh, to many journals simply because the libraries can't afford. So, and, and uh, yeah, I had a professorship in Germany before and like one third of the top journals in my disciplines were mm -hmm. simply not available. Simply because the library can't afford it. So, uh, in that well, sense, Raphael would say sense, wrong university. That's why I came. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But that's 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 indeed. Uh, I mean, that would be a problem. Um, but but obviously, like uh, filling these filling these gaps and and still um, like finding financing models. That's that's really that's really important and crucial. But maybe once more, like you made the point, it's so straightforward, and you just pay the article fees, and then it's done. But my point is, like your company has no interest in a general philosophy. Uh, journal maybe immediately to finance the articles there. So we have to be careful in where to push from public to private financing models. So there, there is no, there is no way that we substitute uh, the taxpayer money totally because that that would be to the uh, not to the best uh, of the entire uh, scientific community. Zibille, before you answer, uh, let me add one question to that because I think that's an interesting one. Uh, will the future not be a mixed? economy between open access and paywalled content and between publicly and let's call GSK mm -hmm. and Takeda privately funded um, institutions. So is the new reality not that the funding is just organized differently um, to really make sure that the philosophy of mind and uh, insurance issues in agriculture really go hand in hand and there is a library or, or, or research structure there in the, in the future? So can I ask a question in return, just, you know, yeah. to really to get the discussion moving along? Um, so where does the taxpayer money come from originally? So the taxpayer, I mean, the taxes are paid largely either by individuals or by companies and by commercial interest. They go to government and then come back as if, that's not where they came from originally. So if you, th if you think of it in that way, there is no reason that you couldn't have a similar, um, but much smaller, obviously, um, situation where money comes from you know, companies, but they are not paying just for individual articles or individual journals. And I think this is one of the things that's really important. The fact that the money comes from a particular source doesn't mean that those people get to choose how the money is used. And I think that's, that can work in different ways. And it's, it doesn't have to become a tax and government run scheme in order to work in that way. Well, it sounds a little bit like a promotion for knowledge unleashed, which <laughs> I'm happy to take. <laughs> Accidentally, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I completely agree. I think that that there is different funding structures, of course, behind it, um, and um, that there is different motivations. As we as we said several times uh, today, is also uh, really important in this process, so that certain industries are, or certain disciplines are not being left behind. But Zibele, you wanted to say probably something else because you look completely shocked at me. So what was it? <laughs> no, I just try not to forget what I wanted to say. <laughs> That's it's, good. It's um, uh, because, uh, again, uh, to what Raphael said, that there will be big institutions or with uh, high publishing output pay a higher share than the ones uh, who have are smaller, have little research or output. I think that's a short-term scenario, or at least, no, not even that. The short-term scenario, if you look to Germany, is that everybody pays the same as in the past. <laughs> the mid-term scenario is that what you described, uh, um, that uh, institutions with a high output will pay more and others less. 
But what's the next step? That's the question, because what I fear and what I think is that the diversity we see quite in, in research as well would, will get smaller, because what is a government doing with institutions who do not show publishing output? And actually, couldn't we save money there in, <laughs> like, maybe they are not really research, may I'm, there are more schools, or maybe uh, funding is going to be completely different on that uh, end as well. So I think in the long term, we, 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 we will see less diversity in, 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 in many aspects if it's just that open access route. And this is why I actually hope of a, have a hope for a mixed economy as well, which still allows uh, different ways of thinking and uh, yeah, stay open-minded in regards how publishing should work in cer certain disciplines as well or under certain aspects where actually this, uh, the, the, the idea of publishing is a complete different one than uh, um, yeah, we always have in mind with STM, for example. I think it's a very interesting element and everybody who hasn't looked at it yet should probably do it, which is the situation of academic libraries in Denmark because they have seen a merger, a number of mergers over the last years, which I think is really helpful for certain elements because in a relatively small country you can see that there is a higher impact now of the library system, but it's exactly what you are saying. So there are less decision-making structures, there's a better, more efficient distribution of certain elements, yet at the same time, the more central the system gets, the more risk there is that something falls in between the cracks. I think that is something that a mixed economy can help prevent. But Raphael? Sven, yes, you asked for a mixed economy and the mixed business models for literature and information of the future. Uh, I, I'm completely relaxed. As a librarian, I came from 3,000 years ago and look to the eternity. So in this case, I think we live in a wonderful world where it happens a lot. We discuss on the transformation of a publication system, but we are in the middle of this transformation phase and we are not able to know what is in five years or in ten years. We have the chance to try out, to find out various models, to test it, to find it and not to uh, fix it and say this model is for the eternity and that model is not for the eternity. And this is a chance we have to find out what will be the best for the researchers, what will be the best for the society, what is the best for archiving and making available our uh, knowledge of the society and the world for the next generations till to the eternity. And there I think I am very optimistic we will find new ways, we will uh, fix new ways, we will uh, skip new ways, we will uh, give uh, away uh, tests we actually made and we find the appropriate model in the next 10 to 20 years. But we are not able to say now in two years or three years this model is the model for the next uh, 500 years. In this case, I'm relaxed as a librarian and I hope uh, uh, we are able to, to support the science and teaching even in the next uh, 3,000 years. That was not the closing remark yet, <laughs> but already had a good quality uh, of that. Is, are there any further questions? I'm happy to donate uh, at least three minutes of um, my summary because uh, I find it difficult to summarize this anyways. Um, so is there anything that you from the audience would like to ask the panel, which is really a pressing issue right now? There is. That's good. Brett Thomas from uh, Intech Open. I was just wondering if the uh, corporate uh, members of the panel have ever considered producing their own publications, whether that be journals or books or similar. Getting into the publishing business. <laughs> um, not as far as I know from any of the company I worked at. I mean, you know, what would be the value and of having, a, you know, if we want to be part of the scientific literature, like, you know, the other uh, founder of research, I think, you know, creating, I mean, pharma already has a, you know, image issue if <laughs> we start doing a journal on our own. I'm not sure the impact would be there. I mean, and then, you know, there's a peer review process, right? I mean, we really want our research to be reviewed by uh, independent panel of, of reviewers. So um, not, uh, yeah, I don't really see uh, many advantage of that. But. How about you, Santosh, the GSK uh, Journal of Breakthrough <laughs> Research? No, no. <laughs> I, I think we, we, that's definitely not our aim. I, I, there's so in what we are asking the publishing community is to please make our research transparently available. 
at this moment, that's not happening. So I, I, I presume any efforts to work to, uh, together in order to ensure there is trend, uh, open access opportunity for industry, just same as with the academic research, that's a very big step, step for us. That being said, no, I think we are quite busy with what we're doing. Thank you. Any further questions? Otherwise, I would try a summary if you want or leave you alone with the apero, which is fine as well. Um, but let me quickly say um, thank you to the panel. I think we had really a very broad discussion and still managed to get back to the central points, um, namely the question of how can we get uh, to a mixed economy, uh, if we want to use that term, between publicly funded and privately funded research publications, um, how can we do that in a mixed economy with respect to paywall content and to open access content? There is really no need to make everything open access as there is no need to make everything paywalled, I would assume. And it will be an interesting challenge over the next years probably for our industry to differentiate what the criteria are. Um, is it cost criteria? Is it access criteria? Or, or is it other criteria? I found um, the um, discussion of motivations and probably obligations really interesting um, for different parties because in the end it doesn't seem to be so different what um, a pharma company and a researcher at ETH wants which is recognition but also an obligation to basically show that to the funders whoever the funder is what their research is about how it's being conducted and that how it can serve um, the society um, also, we had a conversation on the reliability and the sustainability of industry funding and open access. In my view, that's a very important element. And it also falls um, um, into the same position with visibility because um, the pharma industry and I think also other parts of the industry are putting quite some money into the system, also in open access publications. And it's important that it becomes a normal process and hence is visible to everybody being involved according to transparent and uh, clear criteria. On the publishing side, um, I remember a conversation probably five to seven years ago where I was almost kicked out of room of publishers when I said that publishing is a service and not a content business. Uh, it seems that that is not an issue anymore, at least neither in this room nor with this panel. So I'm really happy to see that there is a movement into that direction that publishers uh, let go certain elements of their um, self-perception at least uh, and really focus on delivering um, services. And as Raphael said, uh, many libraries, uh, at least the ETH library, libraries are um, prepared to um, support researchers with open access. I think that is really something important just the fact that we have you in the room when you are a researcher and also Robert here doesn't mean that everybody at ETH understands and lives open access, um, uses it as he or she should do. So I think that's also an important task for libraries and also for publishers to make sure that the pros and cons are being understood uh, so that the tool of open access in the research communication can be used. I think that is about it. Rafael will have the last word as the head of house. Thank you very much for your attention and focus over the last uh, two hours. And thank you very much to a great panel and a very uh, lively debate. Yes, thank you, Sven, for moderating this uh, wonderful panel and this complicated and powerful panel and provocative uh, discussing, uh, discussing uh, panel here. Thank you, Sven, for moderating and being here. Thank you, the panelists, for discussing and contributing to the questions we addressed here. And uh, thank you in the audience for being here and uh, uh, discussing with us uh, this very important topic. I invite you to uh, discuss uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, outside this room, we uh, invite you to Apero. There you can uh, discuss with us and the specialists here and the experts uh, your personal question. And of course, this is a very important discussion. It was a very important discussion today. We have addressed not only uh, very interesting questions, we didn't find answers to any question, but at the same time, and this is a message for you, uh, this afternoon there will be a 
discussion or brainstorming or a, a negotiation, one can say, non-public uh, discussion, brainstorming in the back office of the ETH library. Uh, for, um, there will discussing representatives of publishing houses with industry partners on this topic, how could the industry uh, contribute in financing this um, open access transformation system. So you see, we do not only discuss academically, we would contribute as the ETH library to making results available, to being partner and productive, constructive partner in this transformation system. And this is information for you. Unfortunately, you and me cannot take part in this uh, discussion, but perhaps there will be some results, not today, perhaps in the next or following uh, discussions. And I'm uh, very grateful to the colleagues from, um, from PLOS and Troy Chemical Society and from you and you discussing this topic uh, in our house. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you again to the Apero outside. Thank you very much for coming and uh, have a nice day. Thank you.